There are a lot of movies that are definitively 80s, but today's episode highlights what might be the most 80s movie of them all. There can be only one. Got good news and bad news, girls. The good news is your dates are here. What's the bad news? They're dead. I'm gonna take you to the bank. Welcome, B-Movie Maniacs, to another episode of B-Movie Babylon, a safe space for trash cinema lovers where we firmly believe the B and B-Movie stands for brilliant. I'm your host, Mike Bracken. Some of you may know me as the Horror Geek on YouTube, or from my stand on Comedy Central's old pop culture game show, Beat the Geeks. Others will remember me as that dick on social media. And really, I'm all of the above. No matter how you know me, thanks for being here as we stalk the forgotten corners of the video store in search of the best B-movies ever made. Whether you love martial arts mayhem, low-budget rip-offs of popular movies, direct-to-video skinamax flicks, classic horror fare, sleaze, or exploitation, I've got you covered. In today's episode, we're headed back to the 80s for one of my favorite movies of all time. So grab your swords, because there can be only one episode of this show on Highlander. This 1986 feature wasn't exactly a huge success at the box office, but it did go on not only to become a cult classic film beloved by millions of fans, but also the catalyst for an entire cinematic universe of films, comics, TV shows, anime, and video games long before cinematic universes were really a thing. It's a film wherein a Frenchman plays an immortal Scottish Highlander who's mentored by a Scotsman pretending to be an Egyptian in service to a Spanish king. On top of that, it's directed by an Australian, and somehow it all works. Today, we'll talk about the challenges of bringing Highlander to the screen, why the film works, and the enduring legacy of the film as we continue to hear rumblings about remakes and reboots. But first, let's talk a bit about my own personal history with this cult classic flick. Trust me when I tell you I had a lot of weird interests as a kid that weren't exactly as cool as they are today. I was into pro wrestling, ninjas, all kinds of supernatural shit, D&D, and video games throughout most of my life. And while it sounds funny to describe those things as not cool in today's world, back in the 80s, loving a lot of this stuff made you a bona fide dork. One of the other things I was really into as far back as I can remember were swords. I like guns and I like to go shooting, but from the time I was a child, I was fascinated by bladed weapons. But as far back as I can remember, we'd go to the fair or to Kennywood Park or Cedar Point and I'd always, without fail, come home with a plastic sword. From bejeweled plastic pirate rapiers to claymores to katanas, if there was a toy sword at one of the gift shops, you could take it to the bank that I was getting it on the way out. That love of swords has continued into my adulthood, where I honestly almost dropped three grand on a custom-made katana a few years back. <laughs> what was I gonna do with it? Hell if I know, but swords are cool, and I firmly believe life is short and you should buy yourself all the dumb shit you want. Now before we go any further, I feel the need to clarify. I get it, there are no shortage of pictures on the internet of dorks with swords. I am not one of those dorks. I'm not trying to cosplay as an anime character or anything like that, I just like swords. So much so that I spent years reading about how they made katanas in Japan and all that, and actually thought about learning to be a swordsmith for a few years. I mean, yeah, sure, that's dorky, but it's not like a neckbeard pretending to be Sephiroth with some flea market wall hanger knockoff that couldn't cut through butter dorky. There's a real art to swordsmithing, and I find a well-made sword to be an interesting piece of art. But yes, I'm a dork. I get it. Anyway, this love of swords has been with me my entire life. So when I was flipping through the movie mags on one of our weekly trips to the local cash and carry supermarket back in 1985, I happened across a piece on an upcoming film called Highlander. It was a real short teaser article, and I don't remember much about it beyond my 12-year-old brain seeing guys with swords in the photos and a description that said they were immortal and could only die if someone lopped off their head. So if you're keeping score at home, this basically ticked all of my boxes. Swords, immortals, beheadings... Naturally, I was all in. Now, of course, money was tight back in those days. We'd moved to Florida after the steel mills closed, and my dad was a carpenter who found work framing houses here for like $7 an hour or something ridiculous. So, a trip to the theater, that was a treat. Beyond that, my parents and I do not share the same cinematic tastes. There was no way in hell my dad was going to drop like 25 bucks to take all four of us to see something called Highlander. I mean, honestly, I had a better shot at convincing him to buy me a BMW, which is something I also tried that didn't pan out. Normally, this wasn't exactly the end of the line for me seeing a film. There was always a chance the local four-screen theater might get the movie. We'd go up there on Friday nights and hang out and sneak into shit they wouldn't sell us a ticket to see. But for some weird reason, we never got Highlander, so I was kind of out of luck until it hit video. 
Between the theatrical release and video debut, Highlander kind of got lost in the shuffle for me, though. There were a ton of canon ninja movies to see, Chuck Norris shit like missing in action, and so on. And I basically forgot about Highlander for a spell at least until probably the summer of 1987. I've told the story many times about how my parents were pretty tight with what movies I could rent. Not so much because they cared about me seeing movies, but mostly because my parents weren't going to spend their hard-earned money on renting slasher movies and Chuck Norris flicks, which they were not particularly fond of for some reason I still don't understand. And the ace in the hole for me was always my maternal grandmother. During the 80s, we'd spend summers with her up north, and she basically loved all the trash cinema I loved and had no qualms about turning me loose in the video store and let me rent pretty much whatever I wanted. And you might think this was how I finally got to see Highlander. Except it wasn't. We did go to my grandparents' place that summer. But while there, we went to stay with some old friends of my parents. Anyway, we went to stay with them for a few days, and it was basically like trips to the mall and eating good pizza and just hanging out. And that first night I was there, as we're going to bed, my dad's friend comes and hands me some videotapes. Since I was a night owl and he knew I was going to be up, he'd basically brought me some stuff to watch. These were even Betamax tapes, which was always my preference to the traditional VHS. So I'm looking at the tapes, and one of them has two movies on it, Blade Runner and Highlander. It was legit like the universe was smiling on me, because I'd wanted to see both, and it just had never managed to make it happen. Anyway, long story longer, I popped that tape into the Betamax player and turned off the lights and jumped right into Highlander. <laughs> I'd be goddamned if it wasn't everything I hoped it would be and more. Immortals, flashbacks, swords, guys losing their heads. It was basically the most perfect thing 14-year-old me had ever seen. Meanwhile, Blade Runner, I was kind of meh on. That was a total discussion for another show, though. But Highlander, man, Highlander was like someone had peered into my brain, took what they found, and decided to make the most Mike Bracken movie ever made. And I loved it. In fact, after watching Blade Runner, it was like 3 a.m., and I started Highlander over. And it was even better the second time. Sitting there in a living room in a charming little eastern Ohio house near Youngstown with a Betamax controller in my hand, I started what has been a lifelong love affair with all things Highlander. We'll talk more about the expanded Highlander universe later in this video, but I really do like most of it. I mean, maybe not Highlander 2, but yeah. But before we get to that, let me take a quick break to pay some bills, and on the other side, we'll dive into the conception, evolution, and enduring legacy of Highlander. Naturally, there are going to be spoilers here, but let's dive into the plot. The very first thing we see in Highlander is an expository title card narrated by Sean Connery. From the dawn of time we came, moving silently down through the centuries. Connery recorded this in his bathroom in Spain as he'd already wrapped his time on the production. <laughs> I guess we don't really need any fancy sound booths after all. <laughs> we should start filming this show from the crapper. This bit of narration has always been sort of interesting to me. On the one hand, it definitely doesn't over-explain what's going on here. Modern movies often feel the need to give away everything right at the top or even in the trailer. On the other hand, Gregory Wyden created Highlander with a pretty detailed mythology and rule set to how all of this worked. So seeing The Gathering doesn't really explain any of this. But all in all, I think it's just enough to get you interested. From there, we head right into the credits with some Rock and Queen on the soundtrack. One of the first things we see is that the film was written by Gregory Wyden, who shares credits with Larry Ferguson and Peter Bellwood. Wyden gets a screenplay and story credit here, but the writing duo of Larry Ferguson and Peter Bellwood also get credit for polishing and expanding the script. As Bellwood explains it, they were brought in to make the film more epic, beyond it just being a story about a, quote, guy in a raincoat with a sword feeling sorry for himself for being immortal. Then we learn the film was directed by Russell Mulcahy. And I think we should stop here and explain something for a second. This episode is going to be the most challenging for me in terms of saying names because I've heard Russell Mulcahy said as Mulcahy, like Father Mulcahy, but I've also heard it said Mulcahy, and I've never heard him say it, so I don't know how he pronounces it. Then we get to Christopher Lambert, who is sometimes Christoph Lambert, sometimes Christopher Lambert, or sometimes Christoph Lambert. So we're just going to call him Christopher Lambert and Russell Mulcahy and just roll with it because you know who I'm talking about. Mulcahy says he got his first camera at 14 and started making films straight away. He eventually became an editor for the Australian News but continued making film projects on the side. This led to him getting hired to direct music videos for groups like ACDC. His real dream was to be a feature filmmaker, but he explains that the time making music videos was beneficial to his development as a director because of the smaller scale and freedom of the music video format allowed him to experiment with a lot of techniques that he could then transfer to the feature films he was going to direct later. And I was always a, like a frustrated feature filmmaker, but the, 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 the music videos 
gave me an opportunity to experiment and try different techniques. The music video's success eventually led to Mulcahy being offered the director's chair for the cult classic killer pig movie Razorback in 1984. That film is a super stylish outback riff on Jaws that really is quite fun and beautifully shot. After the success of Razorback, he went back to making music videos. In a fun bit of trivia, the Buggles video killed the radio star, which was the first music video aired on MTV at its launch, was actually directed by Russell Mulcahy. The thing that really stands out about Highlander in the 21st century is that it's a film directed by a guy who made music videos with a soundtrack full of Queen songs. It's really just a gigantic music video in some ways, which is arguably why it's still so fascinating to watch 40 years after the fact. I'd argue that Russell Mulcahy is basically a poor man's Tony Scott, but that sounds dismissive and I don't want to be dismissive of Mulcahy's work. But someone once described Tony Scott as a stylish filmmaker where every frame looks like it was shellacked within an inch of its life. And Mulcahy's work has that same visual vibe as anyone who's seen Highlander or Razorback can attest. I mean, hell, I literally had the discussion the other day that for my money, Tony Scott was a more interesting filmmaker than his much ballyhooed brother Ridley, and I will die on that hill. Anyway, the credits end, and we head into the movie proper with some pro wrestling. We've got a match here at the Garden between the fabulous Freebirds, aka Michael Hayes, Buddy Roberts, and Terry Gordy, taking on the High Flyers, which was Greg Gagne and Jim Brunzel, and the Tonga Kid. Mulcahy explains they initially wanted to shoot an NHL game at the Garden, but the league refused. So they had to settle for wrestling instead, and to make life even more challenging, they were basically only allowed to film for 10 minutes. The production really would have preferred a hockey fight here because it provided a better transition from the modern day back to 1500 Scotland. This opening scene is just a taste of what the film will offer up visually. They shot with sky cams in here, and director of photography Jerry Fisher says Mulcahy wanted to get these swooping wide-angle shots of the ring before zooming into the crowd to stop at Christopher Lambert. The challenge of this shot was they had to have a wide angle for the wrestling shots, and to get a close on Lambert's face, they'd have to stop the wired cam literally a foot from his grill, which was way more precise than the rig would allow. So to solve this problem without smashing Lambert's face, they noticed there was a lot of flash photography of the actual wrestling. They simply added a very subtle edit here, one frame of white representing flash flare that matched the angle of the wide shot with a push in on Lambert's face with a closer lens. While he's watching the match, he gets this weird look on his face, and the film doesn't do the best job of explaining what's happening here. It's not that Christopher Lambert is bored with the wrestling, it's that he can sense another immortal nearby. Wyden's immortal mythology made it so they could sense each other's presence in certain proximities, presumably so one immortal couldn't just flat out ambush another. Instead, they'd be aware of each other and have to face one another in combat. But before we get to that combat, we've got a flashback to Scotland as the McLeods and another clan prepare for battle. Back in the present, McLeod heads for the parking garage where he meets another immortal. This was not the garden's parking garage, but instead a car park in England they sealed off. The film regularly cut back and forth between actual footage of New York City and events filmed on sets. Lambert, for his part, was so committed to this role that he wanted to do all kinds of crazy stunts that the insurance company and studio wouldn't sign off on. The film was already inherently dangerous for its actors who were called upon to learn how to fight with swords. Lambert explains there were months of training involved, progressing from plastic swords to wooden swords to aluminum swords, and then finally real steel. One of the things that really worries me about all the rumblings about Highlander reboots and remakes is that they'll probably botch all the cool action scenes by over-editing them into visual nonsense full of quick cuts and close-ups in front of green screens. Mulcahy filmed the original film in a much more flattering way, giving us lots of long shots and extended takes to show off the sword choreography. It's just something I appreciate. As it turns out, the early days of collaboration with Mulcahy were a bit difficult according to producer Bill Panzer. Mulcahy could see every scene in his head, but that meant a lot of the dailies were sort of hard to follow. For this opening garage fight, for example, Panzer says first unit shot for like 8 days, then the second unit shot for 7 or 10 more, then third and fourth units came in, so everything basically could come together in post. The dailies, however, were just bits and pieces of Mulcahy's vision, and it didn't translate well. Panzer was so concerned that he wouldn't even share them with Fox and EMI, convinced they would think the project was in trouble and presumably demand changes. And we looked at this footage and, we're, and Peter and I are going like, oh, let's not show this, don't show this to EMI, don't show this to Fox, they will not understand what's going on here because we don't. After a lot of sword fighting, McLeod is eventually victorious, giving audiences their very first taste of what the quickening would look like. If you're not a Highlander dork like me, the quickening is basically what they call the aftermath of an immortal battle, where the winner absorbs the essence and power of his vanquished foe. It's a very explosive event. 
Mulcahy wanted distinctive transitions so audiences understood when we were going from the present to Connor's past. The first one, up through the roof of the parking garage back to Scotland hundreds of years earlier, has been copied extensively and has become something of a Highlander series trademark. And back in 1536 Scotland, the MacLeods once again prepare for battle, but this time the opposing side has a ringer, the film's villain, the Kurgan. Beyond the sky cams, the film also made extensive use of the Luma Crane. Mulcahy and his team used the crane shots in Highlander because the variety of angles you could get with it made so many shots feel majestic. This shot of the Kurgan is a fantastic example of that in action. Ah, there is one called Connor among them. Aye. If you're not watching this on YouTube, you're just going to have to take my word for that. Everyone says Clancy Brown was terrifying as the Kurgan, but that he was a super nice guy on set, and that he really had to stay in character as the Kurgan during filming. It's impressive he was such a nice guy, because Brown has said in recent years that he not only wasn't paid for his work, but that he doesn't get any of the Highlander residuals either. Producers Davis and Panzer really should rectify that, because Brown's Kurgan is one of the greatest screen villains, and his presence is integral to this film's success. For his part, writer Gregory Wyden says the biggest difference between his script and the film is in the presentation of the Kurgan. Wyden finds the film's version of the character more like Freddy Krueger in that he's a cackling psycho. The Kurgan in, in um, Highlander, as it is, is pretty much like Freddy. You know, he's just a cackling psychopath. The writer saw him as a more tragic figure who'd repeatedly lost everything dear to him over the centuries and was just continuing on out of a sense of obligation to finish the gathering and win the prize. You know, you lose everything over time, and the only thing that he could hold on to to give him a reason to get up in the morning was to finish this thing and finish it with our guy. And I suppose this is as good a point as any to discuss both the evolution of Highlander and how it came into existence. Gregory Wyden explains the original idea for Highlander came during a trip to Great Britain when he was just 19 years old. As he walked through the Tower of London's armor and weapon collection, he started to think, what if you had actually lived long enough to wear all of this armor and use all of these weapons and were giving someone a tour of the room? This idea does make it into the film, when Roxanne Hart visits Connor's home late in the second act. The truly amazing thing about Highlander is that Wyden wrote the script while in a screenwriting course run by Richard Walter at UCLA in 1982 at just 20 years old. The script was part of his coursework for that semester. He said repeatedly that Ridley Scott's The Duelist was a thematic inspiration for his story. Wyden, interestingly enough, paid for his film school education while working as a full-time firefighter, a fact that would come into play years later when he wrote the script for Backdraft. He acknowledges that much of Highlander was written in a firehouse between calls. Professor Richard Walter felt Wyden's script was good, which was proven true when it was bought and presented to producer Bill Panzer. In the making of Highlander, Panzer explains a friend who was an agent would wander around the local film schools looking for scripts. He brought Wyden's script to Panzer, who saw the potential in the idea, even if the script was darker and not as romantic as they wanted it to be. But it was much darker and it was less romantic. From there, they went out and found Russell Mulcahy to direct. After Razorback, Mulcahy returned to making music videos, until he got a call from producers Peter Davis and Bill Panzer, who wanted to send him a script to a project called Highlander. Russell Mulcahy has always been a brilliant shot maker, a brilliant stylist, and, you know, in Highlander, he got his first chance to, you know, sort of tell a story with human beings rather than rock stars or a pig. Okay, he read the script and loved it. He had a bit of everything. Action, adventure, romance, and he jumped at the chance to direct. When it came to casting Connor McLeod, Mulcahy says he was presented with a list of leading men, and that it was the same basic 20 names he got for every lead role. Not particularly convinced any of them were the right fit, he kept looking. While perusing through a magazine one day, he found a photo of Christopher Lambert, who'd been Tarzan in Greystoke, the legend of Tarzan, and he immediately knew he'd found his lead. After reading the script, Lambert says he went back and watched Razorback to get a feel for Mulcahy's work and that he was struck by how the filmmaker's visuals were always front and center and that he was very drawn to that level of creativity. It was then up to Panzer and Davis to convince the studio that Lambert was the perfect leading man for the part by showing them one clip from Greystoke. But when they finally met him, concerns arise. First off, he's not six foot two as they've been led to believe, but even worse, his English is serviceable at best and he's got a crazy thick French accent to boot. But as that meeting went on, they realized that Lambert really understood the character's motivations and the deeper ideas of the film, 
And since they'd already signed the contract, there was no real way to change the casting anyway, so he kept the part. I'm pretty sure that originally they wanted to approach Sean Connery for the lead, but he was really too old to pull it off, and then just was more interested in playing the mentor role of Ramirez. So, if you're keeping score at home, that's a Frenchman playing a Scot, and a Scot playing an Egyptian. With Lambert and Connery attached, this odd little script that was probably never going to go anywhere suddenly had bankable talent involved. Now they just needed a villain. Their first choice was Arnold Schwarzenegger, but he passed because he was more interested in playing good guys, apparently. But they did know Clancy Brown from his work on Sting's The Bride. He was big, he could act and do the action scenes, and he had charisma, so he wound up getting the part. And with that, they had their main cast, at least outside of McLeod's love interest Brenda, who we'll talk about shortly. Back in the film, the Kurgan's only here for one reason, to kill Connor, which presumably is going to make him immortal. And then the Kurgan's going to finish him. There can be only one! This isn't really explained well, but the Immortals have a sense not only of other Immortals, but guys who haven't had their first death and embraced being an Immortal yet. The Kurgan's kind of cheating here, trying to kill someone who doesn't even know what he is at this point. Back in the present, a 400 plus year old McLeod is trying to escape the garden, but he's going to get nabbed by the cops. And back to Scotland, because yes, this movie hops around in time a lot, so put down your phone and pay attention. Connor's wounds look mortal, but here's actor James Cosmo as Connor's cousin, and you probably remember him as G.R. Mormont, head of the Night's Watch on Game of Thrones, or as an Irish priest in Sons of Anarchy. He's one of our great character actors. Back in the present, we meet our last main character, forensic expert Brenda Wyatt. She's played by Roxanne Hart. Hart got the part of Connor's love interest Brenda after meeting with the producers. Prior to getting the role, she'd mostly been known as a stage actress. Her initial reaction to the script was that it had a lot of interesting ideas about living forever and the like, but that it was also extremely violent. Today, she admits that it's not nearly as violent as she thought. They originally offered the part to Brooke Adams, but she dropped out. Hart got the role, and the rest is history. Hart had previously been in The Verdict and talks about how they only did two takes per scene on that film, whereas Mulcahy shot a lot more and did things in the moment with very little rehearsal. So this was a bit of an adjustment for her as far as preparation. I should also point out that one of the cops is veteran character actor John Polito without his mustache. Polito went on to work regularly with the Coen brothers and had a part on the much lauded NBC cop drama Homicide Life on the Street. Anyway, Brenda and the cops get their first clue something weird is going on when they find Facile's sword, a very rare Toledo Salamanca blade. Given that McLeod, who goes by Russell Nash in the present and is an antiques dealer, is found fleeing from the scene where there's a body and a million dollar sword, well, the cops think they have a motive and start their interrogation. And even the cops notice that Lambert doesn't sound Scottish. You talk funny, Nash. Where are you from? Lots of different places. One of the things that Mulcahy liked about Lambert was that he looked sort of ageless and like he could be from anywhere. As mentioned, this was only a second English language film, which meant they had to hire a dialogue coach to work with him for weeks to make sure he got the wording correct. I should probably hire that guy for this show. In retrospect, I'm not really sure modern day McLeod not having a Scottish accent is a big deal. He's over 400 years old. He's lived so many different places. It makes sense that his accent would change over the centuries. And it turns out McLeod isn't the only guy who's made it to modern day New York either, because here comes the Kurgan. I like his sort of giant Glenn Danzig look. Kurgan signs into the hotel as Victor Kruger, and since Highlander came out like eight months before Nightmare on Elm Street, I'm guessing this is just a coincidence, but it is kind of cool. And we get our first look at the Kurgan's awesome broadsword, which can be assembled like a gun. I'm not convinced that would actually make for a good sword, but 15-year-old me thought it was awesome and didn't care. 51-year-old me still thinks it's awesome and still doesn't care. Mulcahy says he kept the sword and case, and eventually loaned it to Planet Hollywood for display. During the film's dialogue, Kurgan again mentions The Gathering, which was a bit confusing to all of us back in the day. Wyden felt that Bellwood and Ferguson scrapped some of his mythology in their rewrite, and The Gathering was probably something they could have explained earlier. It's a time where all the remaining immortals come together and fight until only one remains. That immortal wins the prize, which basically makes him or her a god. McLeod, meanwhile, is back in the garden to collect his sword, but he's got company because Brenda's here too. Then he basically follows her to a bar, kind of like a creepy stalker. The only real point of mentioning this scene is because it features one of the Queen songs featured so prominently throughout Highlander. Mulcahy says he contacted Queen once filming was done, and then brought them in to watch what was essentially a 20-minute sizzle reel of scenes from the film. He hoped they'd do one song for his film because he loved the band and their work on the Flash Gordon score. However, he was completely taken aback when they told him that each member of the band wanted to write a song for the film. 
Freddie Mercury wrote Princes of the Universe, Roger Taylor wrote It's a Kind of Magic, Brian May wrote Who Wants to Live Forever. All told, there are like nine Queen tracks featured in the film. I might be off, but I'm pretty sure it's nine, though. I should have gone and counted. The band then worked with Michael Kamen, who took the songs and created orchestral versions of them as well. So this way, the film can feature majestic instrumental versions of them that segue seamlessly into the actual Queen tracks. This made the songs more than just soundtrack songs, and instead made them an integral part of the tapestry that is Highlander. And really, it's hard to imagine Highlander being as good without the Queen tracks. I look at Highlander in sort of the same way I look at Suspiria. Both are visually stunning films with iconic soundtracks that actually elevate the material. Suspiria wouldn't be the same film without Goblin's music. Highlander, with its operatic excess, works perfectly with the over-the-top musical stylings of Freddie Mercury and crew. That being said, it wasn't always smooth sailing between the director and the rock stars, though. One of Queen's requests was that they'd get final approval over the sound mix in scenes where their music appeared. Mulcahy would often want the mix in those scenes one way, but was at odds with the band who would come in and mix them a different way. And Queen won out in the end. On the way home from the bar, McLeod encounters the Kurgan. Nice to see you again, McLeod. Nice to see you. This scene definitely feels like something straight out of James Cameron's Terminator. Mulcahy explains that early on in the shooting, the film was too well lit. He told cinematographer Jerry Fisher to use fewer lights. Fisher was apparently not convinced this was a great idea, but came around to it after he saw some of the rushes of the film in production. But obviously, we can't get a beheading here, so the police show up. Just another night in the Big Apple. Two guys sword fighting in an alley. Fun fact, producer Bill Panzer did the police officer in the helicopter's voice. Back in the 1500s, Connor has miraculously recovered from his mortal wounds, which have his clan family convinced he's in league with the devil. The scene of Connor being chased out of his village because they fear he's a witch or a demon is the first time we see that being immortal may not be all it's cracked up to be. Connor basically loses his family, his bride-to-be, his home, his clan, all because he cannot die. It's a pretty powerful scene, which is probably why the television series basically recreated it for Duncan. Back in New York, we see McLeod has done well for himself, because he has a really sweet loft. Turns out this wasn't a real apartment, but was actually a set they built in an old biscuit factory in London. And then we get to see where McLeod gets his antiques. Probably a lot easier to be an antique dealer when all the antiques are things you've owned and used throughout your centuries-long life. From there, we jump back to the past and see the new McLeod homestead. While many of the Scottish castles in the film were real, Connor's Keep was actually built by the production on a mountainside in Scotland. Building in the harsh environment was a challenge for the team that was then doubled when they had to build a second ruined version of the keep for the aftermath of the Kurgan and Ramirez battle. They built the base, and then the top half was actually an elaborate map painting on glass. Anyway, it's a good life. He's happy, he's got a new girlfriend, but it's all about to change. Because almost 40 minutes into the film, Sean Connery is finally here. And I'm at your service. To sell Connery on the role, Mulcahy went and met with him one-on-one. -on -one. He has explained that he was super nervous about the meeting. Back in the present, McLeod realizes Brenda wrote the book on metallurgy and swordsmithing. Literally. Then we get yet another great transition back to Scotland. The scenes with Lambert and Connery are really fun. They bicker like an old married couple, and they have genuinely great chemistry. For his part, Lambert acknowledges it was a little bit intimidating to be a Frenchman playing a Scot with Sean Connery on the set. While he had a voice coach to help him with both the English lines and the accent, his Scottish co-star would occasionally give him advice on proper inflection and the like to better hit the Scottish tone. The underwater shots here were done in a diving pool in London with a scuba diver out of frame to share air with him since Lambert was weighted down. Connery is here basically to mentor McLeod on what it means to be immortal. And while a lot of that revolves around mastering the sword and all that, there's a deeper lesson. You will live forever, largely as an outcast. What I do know is that because you were born different, men will fear you, try to drive you away. Lambert says he was immediately drawn to the script, but not so much for the action sequences, but more for its musings on the unimagined burdens of being immortal. How do you cope with knowing you will never die and everyone you've ever loved will? What does it feel like to know that you will lose your home and potentially your entire identity to the sands of time? Then you'll live forever in the shadows, continually forced to reinvent yourself. It's a heavy burden. Writer Gregory Wyden elaborates on this, saying that Highlander is, at its core, a tragedy about loss, and that's part of what elevates it beyond just immortals with swords running around trying to kill each other. He goes on to add that he feels that none of the subsequent entries in his universe have ever managed to capture that, but this is a point I disagree with pretty vehemently. 
Highlander the series, which replaced Connor with his distant relative Duncan, leaned very heavily into the tragic elements of being immortal and the sense of loss that comes with knowing you'll outlive everyone you love. This is probably why I consider the series the second best thing in the whole franchise beyond this film. But hey, we do finally get a definition of the gathering. When only a few of us are left, we will feel an irresistible pull towards a faraway land. Oh yeah, and one more important rule. You are safe only on holy ground. None of us will violate that law. The holy ground thing interested me for a long time. I always wonder what would happen if immortals actually broke this rule. The series has an episode where they mention the last time two immortals fought on holy ground was in Pompeii, and then Vesuvius erupted. And the sword training might be done, but the lessons aren't, as again, we see the downside of being immortal as Ramirez explains that McLeod must leave Heather. And there's basically a really great scene of Connery explaining his own loss and trying to spare Connor the same, which again, ties back to the real thematic heart of the film. From here, we move inside the keep, and since it was half a set with a matte painting at the top, they had to find a different location for the interiors. The inside of the keep was actually built inside a fertilizer warehouse. They opted for this instead of a set because the warehouse had higher ceilings. And we even get a little Kurgan backstory here. They were people from the steppes of Russia, and they were not particularly nice. Anyway, Ramirez's time in Highlander is about to come to a close, but I did want to point out this great map painting. Sorry if you're not watching this episode and just listening. It's at 5311 in the film. McLeod is out, leaving Ramirez and Heather in the keep when the Kurgan shows up. He's busting down the door like the big bad wolf. The Kurgan Connery showdown had some drama beyond what was on screen. When Clancy Brown breaks through the door and smashes the table in the first take, he swung sideways instead of the rehearsed vertical in the excitement of the moment. This broke his sword and sent a candelabra flying that nearly nailed Connery in the head. Apparently, Connery was not thrilled about this and actually walked off the set, but returned to do another take after an incredibly apologetic Clancy Brown spoke with him. Ramirez and the Kurgan have a great battle here, bringing down the keep around them before Ramirez loses his head. They had to bring the whole thing to come down in giant chunks, which was a bit of a logistical challenge. And again, the scene compositions are just lovely. This is the kind of craft you just don't get in today's CGI world. The matte painting background, the set, it's clearly not real, but it has so much more character than CGI or real locations. It's just a testament to the level of craftsmanship here, and to use cell animation for all of the film's lightning effects. Back in the present, Brenda shows up with questions, but our man McLeod is going to use it as an opportunity to get a dinner date smooth. And we do get one of the deleted scenes restored in this version, which reveals how Connor and his secretary Rachel met. Connor saved her when she was a child during World War II, and she's been with him ever since. This sequence was one cut from the US release of the film, but has been restored on the Blu-ray. I think it's good it's back. I always wondered how they came to be together. Mulcahy explains they basically shot this in an afternoon with a small crew. In an interesting bit of trivia, the SS officer is played by Don't Look Now filmmaker Nicholas Rogue's son. From there, McLeod heads to dinner with Brenda, who's clearly a little nervous about being alone with a guy who might be a killer, so she's placed a gun and a tape recorder nearby. Russell Mulcahy explains this was Roxanne Hart's first scene in the film. Her first scene wasn't exactly an easy one, since it required chemistry with a co-star she basically just started working with. But eventually they do settle down and have some drinks. This brandy sniffing scene was inspired by music producer Jim Steinman, who opened a bottle of wine with Mulcahy and inhaled the air out of the bottle, explaining that he was breathing air from decades ago. He went on to add that this was basically as close to time travel as we'd ever get. That's kind of true and awesome, if you think about it. Anyway, Connors even brought her a gift. <laughs> a copy of her own book. Yes, and she probably already had one. With the date a dead end, we head back to 1500 Scotland for what really is the theme of the film presented in a lovely montage with Queen's Who Wants to Live Forever on the soundtrack. Here we see McLeod watch Heather grow old and die while he doesn't age at all. I gotta tell you, Highlander really does hit differently as a guy in his 50s. When you're a teen seeing this for the first time, all you can think about is how cool it would be to live for eternity and fight other immortals with swords. When you're in the second half of the voyage that is your life and have lost people along the way, you suddenly come to realize that maybe watching everything and everyone you've ever loved die is kinda shitty. Back in New York, McLeod meets with yet another immortal, Sunda Castagir, played by veteran actor Hugh Quarshie. This highlights one of the things that I've always liked about Highlander. The immortals come in and out of each other's lives. Some are enemies, some are friends, some flip-flop over the centuries. It's one of those ideas the television series really ran with and why Highlander's universe could run forever. There are just stories upon stories that you could still tell. This, of course, leads to another flashback, this time with McLeod dueling poorly in 1783. 
Wyden, for his part, says he feels the script was more serious than what ended up on the screen, that Bellwood and Ferguson upped the comedy and farcical elements. Wyden acknowledges being very focused on the rules of his unique brand of immortality, and notes that sometimes Bellwood and Ferguson threw the rules out the window in favor of comedy or other cinematic elements. This scene is one of his examples. McLeod loses, getting stabbed in the gut, but then just laughs it all off. In Wyden's view, yes, Connor is immortal and can't die, but the injuries still hurt. This would be something the series would adhere to more than the film. That evening, the Kurgan and Castagir square off, and of course this guy with the gun is going to interfere. Obviously the Kurgan wins, but he gets blasted too, and then the shooter gets stuck like an hors d'oeuvre for his troubles. The ensuing quickening here was so explosive and loud the cops from other areas showed up thinking it was a real explosion. Okay, he explains, this was one of the things he loved about making Highlander. After he got the job, they basically just turned him loose and let him work which made for a great experience for him to not have producers and studio people constantly looking over his shoulders and second-guessing every decision he was making. With Castagir dead, there are now two immortals left, McLeod and the Kurgan. So we're getting close to the final showdown. But first, Brenda has to figure out that Russell Nash doesn't actually exist. <laughs> Identity theft was clearly a lot easier back before the internet and all that. With that settled, we get to one of Highlander's most infamous scenes, the church meeting between McLeod and the Kurgan. Mulcahy explains this was filmed in a church in London. They agreed to allow them to film there because they needed money. The scene is also our first look at Incognito Kurgan. The producers and Mulcahy were surprised at just how big Clancy Brown was. They had seen him in The Bride, but had no idea how big he was until he came to meet them in person. Brown stayed in character by listening to heavy metal during takes, and he even came up with the Better to Burn Out line. It's better to burn out than to fade away. <laughs> Honestly, Clancy Brown just absolutely owns this scene. It's fantastic. But before we can get to the final showdown, we gotta move the romance subplot along. McCloud shows Brenda he's immortal, and then they hook up. Immortality is clearly catnip for the ladies. In the next scene, at the zoo, we find Kurgan lurking around in the background like Michael Myers. This is a really cool shot, but it does kind of contradict the mythology of the immortals. By the film's own logic, Connor should have immediately sensed the Kurgan's presence and been on edge. He only senses him at the end of the scene here, which is kind of pointless. But since the Kurgan now knows Brenda is Connor's new special lady, he kidnaps her as bait, which will take us right into the epic final showdown of Highlander, which will take place near the Silver Cup Studios sign. The ending was originally supposed to involve a Coney Island roller coaster's complete destruction, but that proved too costly and difficult to pull off. So Mulcahy and the set designer happened upon Silver Cup Studios in New York and transformed the sequence for that setting instead. They shot the scenes here overlooking New York City from the actual sign. The interiors were done on a set. With everyone here, the battle gets underway, and it's basically everything you've been waiting for. The collapse of the Silver Cup sign and the water tower proved challenging because they couldn't do it with CGI. Instead, a one-third scale replica of the sign, which actually lit up, had to be dropped into approximately three feet of water, which presented a potential electrocution hazard for anyone on the set. To prevent this from happening, the collapse of the sign was done in stages. A group of stagehands held each section up with a cable and dropped it when their number was called. As they dropped the section, they also cut the power, ensuring nothing live actually hit the water. It's totally wild, because today they'd CGI this whole thing. Naturally, the nature of the sign meant they were only going to get one take, which was nerve-wracking, but did work. For her part, Roxanne Hart was a real trooper. She didn't have a lot to do other than scream during the last part of the film, but she did get bonked in the head with a prop sword. Fortunately, it was a light one and not sharpened. After some more fighting, they eventually crash through the roof into what Mulcahy refers to as the Blue Room for the final sword battle. Again, it's shot in a lovely wide angle with a sweeping Luma Crane camera shot and minimal cutting. The film's swordmaster was the legendary Bob Anderson, who had worked with Errol Flynn. By the end of filming, Mulcahy says Anderson had turned both Lambert and Brown into respectable screen swordsmen. They're not exactly Tomisa Burrow Wakayama or Katsu Shintaro, but it works. Oh yeah, remember I said Brenda basically didn't have much to do with the climax? Well, she does club the Kurgan with a pipe. The sparking effect on the swords in the final showdown was achieved by hooking up car batteries out of frame to the swords. Which sounds dangerous, but it worked. And then he ends it once and for all. Or at least until they decided to make the sequels. So, Connor gets the prize. There can be only one. All of the final quickening was done with cell animation because again, CGI wasn't yet a thing. The prize basically makes Connor a god amongst men. He's no longer immortal, so he can father children and live his life with Brenda, 
Oh, and he knows everything, basically. For the film's final scene, The Kiss in the Mountains, they actually flew Hart back to Wales weeks after she'd finished shooting. She also reveals that she's still recognized by people from her work in the film, a testament to the enduring legacy of Highlander. Mulcahy, for his part, feels that making Hart Connor's love interest really painted them into a narrative corner. Connor wins the prize and basically decides to become mortal so he can live and grow old with Brenda. Which is fine for a standalone film, but when they realized Highlander had sequel potential, they were sort of stuck. The last immortal had basically given up his immortality. But they never considered that there'd be a sequel when they made the film. Lambert, meanwhile, sums up the experience of being Connor McCloud by comparing it to Mel Gibson as Mad Max or Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones. It was a career-defining role for him, and even though he's been in countless other things, people will largely always remember him for this one iconic role. Alright, let's take another break and then talk about the legacy of Highlander. Highlander made its theatrical debut on March 7th, 1986. Not exactly the summer or holiday blockbuster season, which probably gives you a hint about how things went for the film. As producer Bill Panzer tells it, the film absolutely bombed at the US box office. Critics didn't really get it, and the crowds here didn't exactly flood the box office trying to get tickets. Online reports say the film made $12.8 million against the $19 million budget, although Panzer says the actual budget was only $12 million by his recollection, so the film basically broke even by his math. The rating was kinda on the wall from the opening weekend, where Highlander only managed to make a paltry $2.5 million bucks. And yet, while it wasn't exactly a big box office draw here in America, Panzer does tell a story about heading to France a few weeks later and seeing sold out shows and people lined up to get tickets. Whether this was just one of those examples of the French having more sophisticated tastes than American audiences, or them just showing up to support one of their own stars remains to be seen. Regardless, the film did its theatrical run and then just sort of vanished for a while. But the call to Highlander was already taken off because the few people who did see it and loved it kept talking about it. When the film turned up on cable and home video, it finally found an appreciative audience of guys like me. I have no idea what Highlander has generated in terms of video, DVD, Blu-ray, and television sales, but it was clearly enough that they not only made sequels, but they also spun the property off into a lot of other things. I mean, it doesn't seem crazy to think that the first Highlander has probably generated well over 100 million bucks on its own over the years. And for a movie that costs like 12 million to make, that's nothing to sneeze at. This slow build from box office also ran to cult classic definitely took some time, so this could be the reason why we didn't get Highlander 2 The Quickening until 1991. I can tell you, there have only been a handful of movies in my life that saw me walk out of the theater pissed off. Highlander 2 is one of them. I'm sure it'll get its own episode one of these days. One of the things that drew producers Bill Panzer and Peter Davis to the story in the first place was the seemingly limitless potential of Gregory Wyden's idea. A man who's been alive for 400 years surely has a lot of stories to tell. Stories that could serve as the inspiration for books, and more movies, and a TV show. We wound up with all of those things even after Highlander 2 mostly pissed off the fan base. The original film is the crown jewel of the series, but the television spinoff launched in 1992 is a very close second. That show sees Connor passing the sword to his distant cousin Duncan, played by the equally non-Scottish Adrian Paul, right in the very first episode. From there, it heads off into its own thing, with Duncan moving between America and France. They actually shot a lot of the show in Europe, which makes it feel way more rich and lush than you'd expect from a syndicated series. While doing all that, he's also mentoring a young immortal and getting into adventures both past and present. The first season has a very evil immortal of the week feel to most of the episodes. But as the season progresses and moves into season two, we see a lot of new mythology elements added to the mix with the arrival of the Watchers who are a secret society who chronicle the battles of the immortals vying for the prize. Yeah, we retconned Connor's win out of the timeline, apparently. Then we had the oldest immortal, and lots of other good stuff. Highlander the series ran for six seasons before Paul passed his sword to a new heir in the form of female immortal, and on McCloud, Amanda, for Highlander the Raven. That one didn't last long, which is unfortunate because Elizabeth Grayson was great as the character on the series and was totally capable of carrying her own show. I think the writers and producers clearly just had no idea what they were doing with this particular series. By 1994, the film series was back on track with Highlander 3, The Final Dimension, which was also called The Sorcerer in some places. Apparently, everyone learned from the many mistakes of Highlander 2 and just scrapped pretty much everything from that film in this third outing. The Final Dimension is pretty solid, but it really feels mostly like a rehash of the superior first film. Mario Van Peebles is the evil immortal this time, but a lot of the story beats are basically ones from the original. 1994 also gave us the really weird Highlander, the animated series. 
There was a ton of potential here, only the idea of a children's show about guys who have to chop off each other's heads was maybe not the greatest idea. An even weirder idea was setting it in the 27th century where the last MacLeod, a kid named Quentin, has to square off against an evil immortal named Corton. The animated series ran for two seasons, 40 episodes in all, and also inspired a video game for the equally ill-fated Atari Jaguar CD called Highlander, The Last of the MacLeods. Keeping with the video games, there was also an old Commodore 64 slash ZX Spectrum Highlander game released by Ocean Software simply titled Highlander. I've never played it, but the footage of it looks dreadful. Our best hope for getting to be a McLeod and win the prize was going to come in the 2010s, when a third-person Highlander game was set to be released for PC, PS3, and Xbox 360 through Square Enix. Simply titled Highlander The Game, this title was revealed in 2008, but cancelled by 2010. Like every other spinoff, this one featured yet another McLeod. This time it was Owen. Penned by Highlander the series writer David Abramowitz, this one was going to tie in nicely with the series and the films, allegedly featuring appearances from Duncan and Connor as well as oldest living immortal Mythos. It was set to span a bunch of different eras and kind of sounded like Eternal Darkness in some ways, just presumably minus the cosmic horror parts. Back in the movie world, the people behind the franchise decided it was time to pass the Highlander mantle from Connor to Duncan, which took place in 2000's theatrical release, Highlander Endgame. Honestly, Endgame had the right idea, but the execution was just off. It felt like an extended episode of the show. It did a terrible job of bridging the gap between the film's fans who had never seen the series, and most egregiously of all, it totally wasted an appearance from Donnie Yen. That one made just under 13 million bucks on a 15 million dollar budget. 2007 saw the release of two new Highlander projects, the anime Highlander The Search for Vengeance and Highlander The Source. Search for Vengeance was an anime feature directed by Ninja Scrolls Yoshiaki Kawajiri and written by David Abramowitz. This one follows yet another McCloud, this time named Colin. How many McClouds were there? In the mythology, immortals can't reproduce. So where are all these McCloud immortals coming from anyway? I've never seen Search for Vengeance, mostly because I only like anime with tentacles in it. There was presumably a real dearth of that here, but it did get decent ratings. And finally, we come to the last and arguably worst Highlander film. Yes, perhaps even worse than Highlander 2 in 2007's Highlander The Source. I've never even made it through this one. It was not given a release theatrically, instead debuting on the sci-fi channel. It was supposed to be the first of three new films based on the TV series, but it did so poorly the other films never got made. The source seemingly did what no other immortal could ever accomplish. It killed the McLeod clan once and for all. Or did it? Nothing that makes money is ever truly dead in Hollywood, and Highlander, despite all the missteps and mistakes over the years, still has a rabid fan base always clamoring for more. Naturally, talk eventually popped up about reboots and remakes. Talk of updating Highlander feels like it's been going on for like 20 years at this point. We've had all kinds of proposed projects with guys like Ryan Reynolds and now Henry Cavill linked to the film. Cavill's take on the character seems like it may actually happen. The Witcher actor is still attached and clearly has the sword skills to make it work. And John Wick franchise director Chad Stahelski is set to direct the first film in a franchise aiming to bring in the world of the original and the series and take it all in a modern direction. Normally I'd be less than thrilled about this, but Cavill and Stahelski have me cautiously optimistic. We'll see if it actually ever gets made though. Beyond that, the Highlander machine has also sold oceans of merchandise. I mean, they had their own catalog at one point, sold tons of both licensed and knockoff swords, had a book series for a time, and even branched out into comics. I'll give them this. They were really good at taking this thing and turning it into a money-making machine, which is impressive when you consider that beyond the first film and the mainline TV series, which has been off the air since 1998, most of the various sequels and spin-offs have been of marginal quality at best. But let's take another break for a second, and then we'll talk about where all of the key players in this film wound up after their stint in Highlander. After the success of Highlander, director Russell Mulcahy, stars Christopher Lambert, Sean Connery, and Clancy Brown, would all go on to pretty solid careers. Lambert and Connery would re-team with Mulcahy for the disaster that is Highlander 2. Lambert would then again reunite with the director for the sort of Seven-inspired serial killer film Resurrection in 1999. He's probably best known outside of the Highlander universe for playing Thunder God Raiden in the original Mortal Kombat film, but he worked with Stuart Gordon on Fortress and appeared in a movie we'll definitely be covering here, the 1995 modern-day samurai vs. ninja film The Hunted. 
That one has a really great action sequence on a bullet train that I just adore. That's really just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Lambert, but we could be here all day talking about what the actors of this film have done in the year since 1985. Sean Connery, obviously, continued to turn up in films after Highlander. He was in The Rock, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, The Hunt for Red October, and way too many others to list. His last role was 2003's The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. He passed away back in 2020 at the age of 90. Clancy Brown has also carved out quite a career after playing the Kurgan. Brown would turn up in films like The Shawshank Redemption, Dead Man Walking, the cult classic Starship Troopers, the ill-fated Nightmare on Elm Street remake, and 2023's John Wick Chapter 4. Beyond that, he also has worked extensively in television and been the voice of Lex Luthor in various DC Comics animated properties. Director Russell Mulcahy's resume is an interesting one. His music video work is a veritable greatest hits list of the early days of the medium. After Highlander, he helmed another great B-movie we may talk about someday, Ricochet. And then the ill-fated The Shadow adaptation, and then he helmed Resident Evil Extinction. The most interesting story here is that Mulcahy was hired to direct Rambo 3 in 1988 and actually began work on the project, but was replaced by his assistant director early on because he had creative differences with Sylvester Stallone. Mulcahy, ever the diplomat, says it was, quote, no one's fault, and that he and Stallone are still good friends. Okay, he was unhappy with the outcome of his return to the Highlander universe in 1991's Highlander 2 The Quickening. He says his vision was compromised by the completion bond company's interference, and he was so unhappy about it that he wanted his name removed from the film and to have it replaced with the infamous Alan Smithy pseudonym. However, he was not a member of the Director's Guild and thus could not petition for this change. He did, however, get another crack at the film when they released Highlander 2 The Renegade Cut which was more in line with his vision. But really, the less said about Highlander 2, the better. Finally, we have Roxanne Hart. After playing Connor's love interest in Highlander, she went on to appear in supporting roles in a number of smaller films. She really hit her stride as a television actress, with credits that cover shows like ER, Law & Order, House MD, Criminal Minds, and more. If you've somehow never seen Highlander before, I want to know A, what rock you've been living under for the past 30 plus years, and B, want you to remedy this oversight immediately. Good news is, Highlander is pretty easy to see. There have been a bazillion releases of this thing, from VHS and Beta, to Laserdisc, to DVD, to Blu-ray, and beyond. There's currently a really nice 4K Blu-ray set available that features the film, tons of extras, commentary with Russell Mulcahy, a two-hour documentary, and more. You'll find a link to it in the show notes. But no one wants a movie night that's just one movie, so here are two more picks to help you round out your evening. First up, we have Clarence Fox, 1989 Hong Kong film, The Iceman Cometh. Note, this is not the Eugene O'Neill play. I shouldn't have to say that, but this is the internet, so yeah. This one is very much like a Hong Kong Highlander, blending historical action and fantasy with a contemporary setting too. The fight choreography comes courtesy of the legendary Yen Biao, who also stars alongside Maggie Chung and Yen Hua, amongst other Hong Kong cinema superstars, and it's a legit blast. I had a ton of ideas for the third film in this triple feature, and really had a hard time deciding. I was going to recommend Highlander, The Final Dimension, but it feels so similar to the first film that I'm not sure it's the best pick, even though it's fun and has its moments. But honestly, I really think you have to go with the dreadful Highlander 2. I don't care if you go with the Renegade cut or the original version. You're not going to like either one, most likely. But I think it's important to see it, if only to see how they took something that really worked and almost nuked it by implementing every bad idea imaginable in a sequel. I mean, this is the internet, so I can guarantee someone's going to turn up and tell me they love Highlander 2, and that's great, but it's not particularly good. That being said, it's still worth seeing if you really like a good train wreck. Alright, let's wrap this thing up, because it's gone on forever. One of the things I've always loved about B-movies is their ability to just embrace absolutely bonkers ideas and run with them. This is something that Highlander does very, very well. I mean, it's a story about immortals running around New York chopping off each other's heads so they can win a prize that basically makes them the kings of the universe. But what sets Highlander apart from so many of its compatriots are a number of key things. It's got a fantastic director in Russell Mulcahy who gives us a film that oozes style and looks as though it costs way more to make than a paltry 12 million bucks. It's also got a great cast, led by Christopher Lambert, featuring the iconic Sean Connery and Clancy Brown in a breakout role. But what really sets it apart is Gregory Wyden's script. Sure, it's ostensibly a film about immortals sword fighting in the streets and lopping off heads, but underneath that is a surprisingly touching meditation on love and loss and what it would really mean to live forever. Immortality sounds great on paper, but the reality of it is, is it would probably suck. 
that we still talk about Highlander and its extended universe almost 40 years later is basically all the proof you need that this film remains a cult classic. Here's to hoping future generations learn there can be only one. So, what do you think of Highlander? Have you seen this one before, or is this your first experience with it? Leave me a comment and let me know. I may feature some comments on future episodes. If you're watching on YouTube, please be sure to like and subscribe. If you're on another podcast platform, consider leaving me a review and sharing with your friends. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, and you've just experienced another trip to B-Movie Babylon. The video vault is now closed. <laughs>